All right, everybody. Um, welcome back to OpenShift Commons and to the Transformation Fridays briefing series that I have the pleasure of doing with different members of the Global Transformation Office from Red Hat. Um, and a lot of the times, um, Jay Bloom is my special guest, and he is again today. And I am totally thrilled to have him here for um, a topic about staying with the trouble and building systems we can care for. Um, and just a little background on this. Um, the last briefing we did in 2020, um, we did a, a sort of a review and riff on a number of books that, um, that Diane should read or that Jabe recommended or books that we had um, referenced in past briefings over the past um, year. And one of them was um, Donna Haraway's Staying with the Trouble, Making Kin in the Chahusian, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Um, and it was an unexpected book um, around the themes of um, systems thinking. And I am so grateful that, um, that Jabe did recommend it. Um, and it may seem um, an unlikely book um, for uh, systems thinking, but once you dive into it and realize um, what it is um, that she's talking about and the inter um, play, um, the being with the oddkins and some of the words that she uses and reshapes for her purposes, it really does um, come to a point where it's talking about collaboration and the collaborations that we need um, to make um, to stay um, in, in the trenches, whether it's in our tech organizations or in our activism or any part of the world that we live in. And um, there was a, a wonderful quote at the beginning, and I won't read the whole thing, but I will read this, the, the last half of it. And um, she says, staying with the trouble does not require such a relationship to times called the future. In fact, staying with the trouble requires learning to be truly present, not as a vanishing pivot between awful and even past or apocalyptic or salvic futures, but as mortal creatures entwined in a myriad unfinished configurations of places, times, matters, and meaning. And with all of the stuff that's been going on over the past four years and the transitions and everything we are in, a lot of, um, a lot of what she says really resonates um, with um, where we're all probably at and thinking about um, taking um, our lives forward and our organizations forward. So I'm really thinking that um, today, uh, I encourage all of you to read the book. It's also on audio, so you can audio listen to it as well. Um, but Donna Haraway is one of, uh, I think, one of the great thinkers on this topic, and um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation with Jabe. So I'm going to pause um, and stop sharing and let Jabe uh, introduce himself and take the topic away. And um, again, grateful for the um, the introduction to Donna Haraway, and also the movie that uh, that was made um, with her and in collaboration. Uh, I'll find the link to that too. That was a, an awesome treat over the Christmas holiday. So um, welcome back, Jabe, and um, the stage is yours. Give us your interpretation of this wonderful sure. book. Hey, but if we can, uh, uh, you know, it's hard to do justice to something like quite quite this big in 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 a brief discussion, and I also, you know. Probably want to say before we start, um, you know, the topics that Donna Haraway is trying to address um, certainly I think are applicable to things like organizational transformation and stuff like that, but also uh, should not be minimized in any way. I mean, I think they're very uh, significant topics. Um, so I, I, I will we'll be talking about them in the context of the work that we do, and I think that. They give us some tools and some ways of thinking about that work, but we shouldn't um, we shouldn't minimize them uh, or trivialize them uh, at the same time. Can can you guys see my my uh, slide there? Yes, we, okay. we can. You can see the whole slide, including the the sideways. So you're not quite in pre present mode yet. Yeah. If I go into present mode, then I will not be able to. Then uh, don't don't worry about it. We can read. Slides. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. Uh, Haraway is an interesting character, an interesting um, thinker um, in, in a lot of ways. And um, I want to introduce some of her thinking really quickly um, and then kind of contextualize what she's thinking about a little bit. So Haraway initially was quite famous for having written the Cyborg Manifesto. Um, and in it, she is trying very hard to um, 
to kind of recontextualize this idea of being a cyborg. Um, at the time she's writing this, she's very interested in science fiction, um, close collaborators with a bunch of science, science fiction writers. Um, and, and she's interested in the idea that the kind of cyborgs are always at the time that she's writing kind of war, war machines, humans that have been embedded with kind of weapons or mechanisms to, you know, be aggressive, angry, war making things. And one of the things she becomes interested in is whether or not she can uh, repurpose the idea of a cyborg from a, a feminist perspective. How how would a feminist look at, at a cyborg? What would it be mean to be a feminist cyborg? And, and part of the reason she's interested in that is because she, like, like many other philosophers, um, ha have kind of a, a theory, a, a way of thinking about kind of humans' relationships with technology um, that looks like cyborg. Like it looks like um, like humans regularly um, uh, extend their themselves by attaching themselves or becoming entangled with technology, with with material artifacts, with artificial systems. Um, both that enable them to do things, but also commit them to doing certain things. So in particular, uh, humans who become cyborgs then become committed to caring for the, the machinery uh, that now is part of them. Um, and, and so uh, Haraway uh, spent, spends a good deal of time kind of thinking about this way in which um, humans become entangled with technology and, and what that might mean for uh, the way we kind of think about ourselves. Um, and and uh, uh, other philosophers have, have talked about these ideas. Um, one of my favorite is, is, is named uh, Stiegler. And St Stiegler kind of goes all the way back to um, the, the myth of Prometheus and, and suggests uh, the myth of Prometheus and Epimetheus, who Epimetheus is uh, Prometheus's brother. So, and, and this will kind of like start towards some of the interesting discussions, I think. Uh, Prometheus means forethought and Epimetheus means afterthought. And uh, the gods basically give Prometheus and Epimetheus who are the Titans, who are, who are Titans, um, uh, the responsibility of creating humans, like how, or creating all the animals on the planet. And, and Prometheus kind of like goes away and leaves uh, Epimetheus alone for a while and Epimetheus makes humans. Um, and one of the things about uh, Epimetheus is because he's an a a he's afterthought, he forgets to do things. He doesn't plan ahead, doesn't think about things uh, carefully, doesn't forethought things like his brother. And so he makes humans without fur, uh, without, without a way of protecting themselves against uh, the cold. And so uh, Prometheus gets upset about this, and so um, he goes and steals fire from the gods. And and originally he meant to steal kind of um, the ability to be congenial to each other, to like have politics. But instead he steals fire because he can't get to the other thing, and he delivers fire to humans. And this is the first technology. This is the first artificial system. That's, that is created or is, uh, that enables humans to do something they, they shouldn't be able to do, survive in the cold. Now they can survive in the cold, but then they become committed to it, right? Of course, um, all of this stuff kind of plays out in different ways, but Prometheus eventually gives birth to Pandora and we get Pandora's box and all, all sorts of interesting ways of thinking about technology and the way that technology um, allows humans to do things, but also commits them to do uh, other things. Um, and fire becomes the kind of gift and the curse similar to other things inside of, um, inside of uh, Pandora's box as well. So uh, when we think about these ideas of technology and the interactions with humans, we get different ways of thinking about our relationship to technology and what, what technology is like. Um, and there's three big ones that I like to talk about. Um, uh, I, I got this from one of my other um, uh, PhD students that I worked with, uh, Dr. Uh, Anne. Um, I'm gonna space on her last name, damn it. Um, anyway, uh, anyway, so uh, the three are this. Uh, 
human-centered design, cyborgs, and a actor network, right? So these three are three different ways of thinking about the relationships that humans have to technology. So the first one is like what almost everyone thinks about, and it's human-centered. And the idea of this is that um, there's lots of human beings, and each of them is an individual agent in a system. They, they control all the agency in the system, and they make decisions. They make good, rational decisions about things. And therefore, they can decide to do things like make a hammer, but they use the hammer. They do things with the hammer, and the agency is with the human being. And therefore, the hammer doesn't work well, or the hammer doesn't work quite right, or um, you know, there could be a better hammer. It's because the technology isn't matched well to the human. Uh, that that somehow you could make a better hammer because it would be more ergonomic. It would fit in your hand better, or it would have a better balance, or it would uh, somehow interact with the other technologies better. But all of it has to do with the centering of the design activity of the technology of the artificial system on matching the technology to the human's cognitive abilities or physical abilities. Yeah, um, so it becomes human-centered, in which case kind of technology is inert, it's objective, it doesn't have uh, politics, it doesn't have um, agency, it doesn't do things. Humans do things with technology, yeah? Um, and, and you can hear this kind of idea, this way of thinking, um, in things like uh, guns don't kill people, people kill people with guns, right? Like the idea is that guns are inert, they don't do anything, yeah? Um, there's another uh, version of this kind of way of thinking about designing and material interactions and technology interactions, and that was from a guy named Bruno Latour. Latour and, um, and Haraway uh, consider themselves kind of co-travelers. They, they, they work together, they talk together about similar things. But they have subtly different opinions. Recording has started. They have subtly different ideas about how, how this kind of works. And, and one of the things that they say is this, uh, one of the things that Latour says is this, is that um, things, objects, uh, technologies, hammers, guns, nails, all, all the things around you have agency or they, they're, they are agents, right? Um, and so there's a little bit of a rewiring of what we mean by agency. So like agency for in, a, in a kind of humanism perspective means like the ability to make decisions. In, in Latour's world, he wants to say that, uh, that technology is it, it has agency because it can influence your decisions. Uh, it can change what's possible, right? And so he would say something like, um, guns uh, have agency. And how do guns have agency? Well, if, if I were locked in a room with someone I was having a fight with and there was no gun in the room, the fight would emerge in a certain kind of way. We'd probably, you know, spar with each other verbally. Maybe we would try to talk each other down a little bit, whatever. But if there was a gun in the room and I felt threatened by the other person, the interactions would be very different because I might be worried that he's gonna grab the gun or he might be worried that I'm gonna grab the gun. In which case, the gun, the presence of the gun changes the social interactions that I'm having, right? It changes what's possible. It changes how I imagine this system is unfolding. Um, and therefore I react differently and therefore the gun has agency. Yeah? So in, in Latourian language, you are a gun man or gun human. You, you are merged with technology um, a, a, as a unit, um, as a system, where the human and the gun become kind of a greater system, yeah? Um, but uh, also uh, there's this uh, lack of, it's a network theory, right? So it's not, it's, there's not an entanglement, there's a set of relationships and different relationships produce different kind of outcomes or different expectations of outcomes. Haraway the, is the, a third version of this and one of the things I'll say about Haraway is Haraway also considers herself kind of a co-traveler with um, Isabel Stengers. And Stengers has an idea that she calls cosmopol cosmopolitism. cosmopolitism. Um, and, and what she means by cosmopolitics is that this idea that um, the, so 
Uh, cosmos is uh, the opposite. Uh, you, the cosmos is the totality of all um, all localities, right? So, in, in in Greek thought, this is the idea that like um, you are a cosmo. You have the cosmopolitan localism, and cosmopolitan localism means that you are um, a Athenian, but you're also a Greek. So there, there's the, the 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 locality that you are part of. You govern um, Athens as 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 a member of the polis of Athens, but you are also a member of the cosmos, which is all of the Greek world. And in this way, you get this idea that there's multiple centers of governance. There's like multiple places that are being governed differently, that are evolving differently, that have different ways of being, different ways of thinking about what good and bad are, different ways of negotiating. And that part of that is because they're located in different places. Some some places are on islands, some places are on land masses, some places are near the sea, some places are near the fields, um, and therefore the politics and uh, the relationships that people have kind of uh, emerge from those things. So Isabel Stangers uh, wrote a book with uh, Iligine Prigogine, uh, and Prigogine uh, is is one of the forefathers or one of the, the fathers of something called um, chaos theory. And chaos theory it could, is roughly uh, <laughs> deterministic complexity theory. Um, and uh, what he kind of is talking about with Stengers in this book uh, called The Era of Time it is, is the idea uh, of complexity and multiple interactions and indeterminacy and and the way things become entangled with each other um, in order to support each other, but also th that they stabilize their interactions with each other, but that they can't be separated. Um, if, when they're separated, uh, they, the, when, the, when the parts are separated, the complexity goes away, and so do the emergent properties of the system. So, uh, Haraway is interested in this kind of theory of complexity is specifically this kind of sense in which complexity, calm, plexus, uh, with a uh, plecture, and plecture means weeding or entangling, so complexity is with entanglements. Um, she's interested in this idea of the way that, uh, of thinking through a way in which things are entangled with each other. So if human-centered is like agents completely independent of each other. An actor network is agents that are uh, in a network with each other, they have relationships with each other. Um, Cyborgian theory, uh, Haraway-in theory, this level of complexity now is that they're entangled with each other. So that the cyborg's relationship with technology is not temporary, it, it's embedded, it's in, it's in their body, um, and it extends their existence in, in, in a specific kind of way. Um, and th this stuff leads into ideas by people like um, like uh, Andy Clark, who, uh, uh, who or, and, or William James, who would kind of describe what, what we would call 4E um, cognition or ecological cognition, um, where the idea uh, from like, uh, from James would be, uh, if, you, if you are a blind man, and you have a, uh, a walking stick, uh, you, you don't use the stick um, as in like a tool. It, the, the stick extends your hand to the ground so that as you're experiencing the world, uh, the, the stick is not other than you. It, it is part of your body now. Um, it's part of your way of sensing and being in the world. Um, and there's really interesting, actually, scientific tests around this, that one of my favorite ones being that um, they, they, they will take someone uh, and they'll have them put both hands on a table and they'll take a hammer and they'll hit the table with the hammer, not the, not the person's hands, hit the table with the hammer so that the person can feel the vibrations of the table. Um, and then they'll say, okay, can you take your left hand down? And take your left hand down and then they'll put a fake left hand there. So the person now looks down and sees what looks like two hands again. And then they pick up the hammer and they smash the fake hand with the hammer. And people have a distinct sense in this experiment of pain that, that, that they've been hit 
by the hammer, right? So this idea that uh, we have these kind of extended sensations or imaginations or ways of thinking about the world in which we're extended se seem to be not just kind of like a metaphor, but actually the way our minds work with the world. Um, and Aunt, Andy Clark would say, um, you know, there's other examples of this, the way in which uh, he actually has a book called We've Always Been Cyborgs, and, and uh, which is excellent. People should read it. Uh, and what he would say in that book is um, everyone's a cyborg. We all extend our minds using technology all the time. Um, and he says, you know, the really simplest version of this is if I give you a difficult enough uh, mathematical problem, like like let's say six figure addition um, or six figure multiplica multiplication or division, you'll almost certainly take out a piece of paper and start uh, doing the math on a piece of paper or you know obviously a calculator nowadays, but let's say you only had a piece of paper. And what he says is that um, the thing to imagine is that you're actually using the paper to extend your mind's ability to remember. To, it's an extension of memory so that you can remember where you are and you can manipulate this complex set of symbols uh, by extending your memory. Uh, and so in which case the paper has become part of your mind. It's become part of the way you think about things. So Haraway is very interested in this initial, in this initial phase of her career, um, how cyborg theory, this, uh, this entanglement of humans and technology Kind of plays out um, in relation to these other theories, I think. So uh, I, I also quoted um, the the same quote that you did, which so I won't reread it. Um, but uh, the idea here um, is that uh, we don't necessarily need these. Uh, actually, it's a subtly different quote than you had. So I, I, maybe I'll, I'll point out to it a little bit more. Um, one of the things that we that often we get um, when we kind of think through uh, through time or through time ideas um, is that uh, we eat, we need to do two things. We need to understand how we got here, uh, and so we need to kind of trace history and understand the decisions and uh, manifestations and materializations uh, that got us to our present location, and so we can understand. Uh, where we are, um, and then we also need to have an idea of where we're going. Uh, we need to have a future. We need to have a goal. We need to have an imagined future, right? Um, and and for for Haraway, in this particular version um, of time, she she wants to talk about an entanglement of time, um, and so that the past and the future um, be, are somehow entangled in the present. Um, and I, the way I like to try to explain this is, is this. Uh, I think for Haraway, the, the past is, a, is kind of like a forcing function. You, 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 you've materialized or made decisions that are pushing you into the future. You can't stay where you are. Um, and, but the options that you have in the future uh, make you have to make decisions. You have to choose whether you're going one way or another. And so the present, the present uh, that she is talking about, I think, here is, is uh, a, a sense in which what questions uh, do we are we currently trying to answer? What, what's the problem that we're trying to solve right now? What is the trouble that we're in? Um, and the, where the trouble is an interaction not just of the past, but an interaction of the past with the future. And uh, you know, to bring in a little bit uh, uh, of other kind of theorists, um, it's 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 the agency of being able to change uh, the the future, be able to kind of nudge the future in one direction or another. That's the trouble that humans end up being in. Uh, humans end up uh, having to change the natural progression of things. Uh, Haraway probably wouldn't like me to use the word natural there, but um, so that one of the ways to think about it is that like um, without without agency, without humans involved uh, in, in a situation, in, one would imagine that the situation would simply unfold towards a future that would be somewhat mechanistic, that it would be kind of uh, in in 
in philosophical terminology would be it would be it would be a materialistic determination it would be a, a deterministic system um humans however because they are involved um kind of embed their decisions and desires and wants and concerns about the future they they embed them in material systems in their technologies and they become entangled with those materials and technologies moving into the future um, so that their future is not simply a set of kind of billiard ball deterministic materialist systems, but instead uh, they're kind of entangled in, in human desire uh, and that, that the materialization of that desire. And therefore they're trying to figure out how to entangle themselves or disentangle themselves from those things. Um, and, and so this leads, I think, uh, for Haraway to uh, want to expand the, the ideas about um, which agents are important and, and how they're important so that we get this Odkin um, concepts that she starts talking about where we get an idea that uh, it's not just humans, that it shouldn't be human centered, it should be kind of, uh, uh, centered around all life on the planet for, for Haraway, um, where uh, you get uh, other species and the recognition of our entanglement with other species. Uh, I think that like one of the easiest ways to think through that for a lot of people nowadays, be just because of the news, is the idea of human entanglement with bees, right? So like uh, we all kind of have an idea or a sense, I think, if you kind of follow the news, that uh, bees could go extinct. And if bees go extinct, it's not just that we won't get honey anymore. It's that bees are the primary pollinators of most of our crops and things like corn require pollination in order to produce corn. You can't just plant corn, the corn has to pollinate itself. Um, and so we're kind of like weirdly entangled and enmeshed in a relationship with this other species uh, in the same way that we're kind of weirdly entangled with uh, our technology, like uh, in a cyborgian theory, right? And then to layer one more thing in there to make sure that we kind of wrap up this other set of theory in really quickly, we're also in a, cosmo, a cosmopolitical relationship with these other agents, where uh, like I'm an Athenian and someone else is uh, from somewhere else in Greece, we don't have to end up having the same local needs, desires, wants, uh, goals, uh, in order to pursue these things. We don't need uh, a shared concept of the future. Uh, what we need is a shared understanding of the current problems, uh, the current ground, the way uh, that things are. So that, so that what, for Haraway, when we talk about staying with the trouble, part of what we're talking about is staying not, not trying to negotiate the future, not trying to like figure out what we all want together um, and, and somehow like collapsing um, the future into one desired shared objective goal, but instead trying to figure out what we all need in order to be able to pursue our own goals um, our, as, as, a, as, as members of a cosmopolitical system, right? And so in that way, we get this idea, I think, um, that what, what, what for Haraway, what she becomes concerned with is the establishment of common ground versus common goals. Um, and I think, you know, in, in resilience engineering theory, um, in, in, in a lot of complexity theory that you're, uh, that, that has to do with kind of human systems and human interactions with technology, this idea of common ground becomes more and more important. And I, it's like this. I have this weird way of saying it when I talk about it um, that I that I think can be useful. Um, a lot of a lot of like human centered design and a lot of ways of thinking through how how do we know what to do next uh, have to do with identifying a future goal, uh, so, some so designing towards something. Um, and getting everyone to agree that that's the thing we should do. That's the goal. That's we should all align around that. And if we don't align around that, we can expect to have kind of lots of divergence, uh, you know, like chaotic behavior, um, and, and, and that, that it will become difficult uh, to achieve that goal. Um, 
but it seems reasonable. If everybody's not aligned to the same goal, you might not achieve that goal. Um, one of the ways to kind of think about the way that common ground works is that it inverts that question. Because what it says is, what, what is the current condition? What is the ground from which we designed from? What, what are we designing from um, in order to achieve a lot of potentially different concerns, right? Like we, we all might have different ideas about what we want uh, the system to be capable of. Um, so you could think about like, again, I, I, I hate to trivialize things too much, but like you can think about the idea of dev developers and operators, DevOps. Uh, one of the ways to think about it would be that we need to be aligned to the same goal and understand exactly what the system should do in the future. And only then will we design and create that system. The other way to think about it would be we all have different goals. The developers want to do certain things. The operators want to do certain things. They want certain properties out of the system. The question then becomes for common ground, what would be required by both parts of the system to achieve their goals? And that becomes the ground. So we're designing from as opposed to designing towards. Um, and the result of this is that, again, we start talking about things like the disposition of the system, the, the likelihood that the system will unfold in certain ways, the likelihood that the system can or can't do things. And if we think about it in transitionary terms, uh, all of these ideas about designing from then start saying things like, if we want to do something in particular, how might we do it? And is the system, and, and what are the different options for doing it? And what, the, given the disposition of the system, given the, the likelihood that the system will do one thing versus the other, when we look at our options, can we pick one based on minimizing the amount of effort required because the system is more disposed towards certain options than it is other options um, in order to achieve uh, long-term goals? So this idea of designing from, uh, condition consequence thinking is another way of saying these type of things, or, or the ideas of common ground, I think have a lot to do with what Haraway wants to talk about here. The idea here, uh, another way I've said it in the past, is that huge amounts of like strategy, strategic design, um, uh, futuring, um, uh, you know, all, all these like strategic design activities inside of organizations and firms are frankly escapist. They, 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 they want to imagine a future without starting from where we are right now. They want to escape the current problems and imagine a better future, as opposed to simply continuously engaging in the most pressing current problems, the, the, the trouble that we're currently in, and staying here as opposed to escaping to an imaginary future in which the technology uh, kind of solves all of our problems. Uh, one of the things to kind of say there is that for Haraway in particular, technology never solves all the problems. It might just move the problems from one place to another, um, but it doesn't solve the problems. There's no like magical technical fix in the future in, in, in Haraway's mind. And so one of the other things to really quickly grasp onto here when we think about this stuff and try to think through it with, with, with Haraway's thought is the difference between like this idea of dynamic balance um, and, and, and what, what's called anti-foundationalism. Um, I'm actually not convinced that, that Haraway would use the term anti-foundationalism, but we'll talk about that at some other point. Um, so when we think about this, um, dynamic balance is this idea that um, that entanglement, the way in which the systems interact with each other, the way in which they play off of each other, um, means that there's not a complete, uh, there's not a complete degree of freedom in the system. Did I freeze? Can anybody hear me out there? We can all hear you out here. Okay, yes, great. you're fine. Keep going. Great. So, um, so there's not a complete degree of freedom uh, in in the systems. The si the interactions between the system create a, a a movement of the system where the system doesn't stay still or or doesn't stay completely stable, but uh, it, it re constantly rebalances itself so that it, so that 
it's re the system is reproduced in, in, in a way that one can recognize that the system that we saw yesterday is the same system today, even though maybe all the parts are, or some significant amount of parts are different or, you know, different, different pieces are involved. Uh, still same system, uh, just in a different, in a different form. And this idea of dynamic imbalance becomes really important um, in relationship to the second piece, which is what's called anti-foundationalism. So it, foundationalism is just this idea that um, the agency, this idea that we keep on pointing at, um, that there is an agent and the agent does something, um, requires the pre-existence of the agent. Like the, there has to be a foundation to the thing um, and, and these ideas um, have to do with, um, with the way in which epistemological um, uh, systems kind of think, think, them way, think their way through things. Um, and any foundationalist system basically says that there, the agent doesn't actually have to pre-exist its actions. The agents can be created in its actions. Um, and in this way, there's this weird thing that Haraway does where she kind of talks about there's not, it's not necessary to like completely understand the past. And, and what she means, I think, by that is that um, there is no need to trace um, your current decision back through a causal chain um, to, to the beginning of time, yeah? There's no need for that. There's no foundational decision that deterministically, like a ping pong ball, ends up causing you to make the decision you're making right now. There's no foundation. Instead, there is an emergent, complex interaction of things that open a significant amount of possibilities. And those possibilities um, are offered uh, through, this set, through this interaction of a complex system that creates a dynamic balance, that opens a phase space, and then your decisions contribute to the future, future complexity of the system, but they only kind of contribute to the future complexity of the system in that kind of like a, you know, butterfly wing kind of way. It would be impossible to trace your decision, um, particularly uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the long term future. It's only that it nudged the system slightly. Yeah? Uh, so there's no foundation. There's no, there's no, um, there's no sense of the causality that you would think of in, in like a Newtonian kind of way. So that, so that when we think about kind of cyborgs and we think about um, cosmopolitical systems involving multiple species and multiple technologies and multiple centers of power, one of the things we end up having to kind of think through um, it, it is that there there is no determinism to it there's only kind of an unfolding of it um and, and that we need because of that because of this cost and unfolding we can net we always kind of have to return to well what's the system like now we have to conter return to this concept of the present or staying with the trouble uh constantly um i think it's interesting to think through and there's all sorts of things that I could kind of rant about here about kind of compressive time and, and our misunderstanding of what it means uh, to be present. Um, and there's all sorts of really interesting things to be said about like, um, you know, Donna Harway likes to say things like it's important to be fully present, but I don't actually think that she means that um, in kind of like a, a Buddhist sense of being fully present. I think, I think, um, the Buddhist sense of detached detachment of being fully de fully present, but but yearning for a detachment or a lack of you know commitment um, uh, as a form of enlightenment. I, I think for Haraway, she thinks that in fact it's the opposite. Staying with the with the trouble is a, is an acknowledgement of our entanglement with the present, our entanglement over time our inability to extract ourselves. And for her, I think this idea of staying with the present or staying with the trouble is about authentically engaging in, in the challenges that we're, we are currently facing as opposed to trying to escape them. Um, so two more slides and then I'll 
stop talking. Um, we get this idea then of process theory versus objective reality or, uh, or senses of ob objectivity um, and independence. Um, one, one of the kind of things to think through here is that Haraway kind of comes from a, a set of theory uh, that's called process theory that goes back to uh, Whitehead and to Deleuze and others um, who, uh, who want to think through um, kind of how, how things become, <laughs> ongoing entanglement, how things kind of um, are, are always becoming. Uh, one of the w weird ways to say this is that uh, for Haraway and for process theorists in general, nothing is ever complete. Uh, um, there's no way of saying what something is because it's it, it it never is. It's never fully there. It's always somehow entangled in the future and the past. It's uh, parts of it are always missing, um, and uh, that has to do with like commitments and and and, um, and and things that we've done and committed ourselves to um in order to create the stabilities and the ideas we have about identity and who we are and and what we want out of the world all of those things require um imagining a future and committing uh and making things um at least you know uh trying to recreate or reproduce things in a way that kind of pulls us into the future because it, what we what we want to be <laughs> What we believe we are is is a commitment to continue to be a way that the way we imagine ourselves, and that is a future state. It's not a present state. So we're never fully there. We're never fully realized. Um, we're always kind of smeared across time in a way. Um, and that that idea um, is you know an idea about like um, expanding what we have a sense of as being present or or you know uh, being. Uh, becoming, yeah. Whereas objective systems um, ha have more to do with kind of like inter independence instead of interdependence, instead of entanglement. It's about the way in which uh, objects are separate from each other and can be evaluated as being uh, unique individual things in the world. Um, and these two theories, you know, they go way back in time, frankly. Um, Heraclitus and Parmenides, you know, Heraclitus uh, argued uh, that you never step in the same river twice, which is a whole interesting conversation to have at some point. And, and Parmenides argued that time doesn't exist, uh, that everything, um, time is an, is, is an illusion. There is no such thing as time. And the, the, the entire universe is fixed. Um, so the, the, the idea that you don't step in the same river twice to Parmenides is roughly nonsense. So the, these ideas, these arguments have happened for a long time. Um, and I will tell you just really quickly, uh, in general, Parmenides has, has been taken more seriously than Heraclides by, by most scientists and, and physicists, especially. Um, and, and Heraclides is kind of considered to be a, a little bit nonsense at times. So um, last thing, kind of call to action part of this um, for, for Haraway and for for a lot of a lot of people who uh, are fellow travelers with Haraway, um, she wants to have. She has this idea like there's a fine line between acknowledging that we're in trouble, uh, that that there's problems. We 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 have problems that we have to solve um, as humans, um, as agents in the world, as 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 oddkin, as as entanglements with uh, the rest of uh, living species on the planet, um, but that we can't, um, we, we, we can't, in her terminology, we can't succumb to an abstract futurism. We can't embrace this escapism of, of imagining that if we just can imagine the right future um, and align everybody against that future, that we will escape um, because we'll know where to go next. Um, uh, and so we can't do this escapism, um, but we also, uh, on the other hand, we can't um, go to the past and say all of the decisions that we've made uh, mean that this is a, is a fuck fit complete, that, 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 that it is hopeless, that there's nothing we can do about it, um, that, that um, 
that uh, kind of the the environmental crisis um, it, it, it's 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 all it's too late uh, now. We we just have to give up. So for her, that 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 is a little bit of this interesting positioning of we can't escape into the future, and we can't excuse ourselves from being um, being entangled with being uh, facing up to our problems in the present by escaping to the past. We can't just say the past determines the future. Uh, we have to uh, work together um, to uh, escape these two extremes, escapism and sublime indifference. Um, and so I think, again, these, the, 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 the context that Haraway is talking about these things in is, is, is kind of environmental, global, like very large timescapes. Um, but I think these same ideas about like uh, about kind of sustainability, um, engagement, understanding, uh, like map some of these ideas onto things like um, technical debt, organizational debt, the way in which we feel like uh, the technolo technological decisions that we've made in the past are over determining the decisions we can make about our futures. Um, so that we feel like the system is in more control than we are um, and and that we give up, <laughs> that we resign ourselves to those things or um, the way in which kind of for uh, for Haraway in, in, in this cosmopolitical conception um, that somehow you have to create a completely aligned ideal future state in order to make good things happen in an organization as opposed to simply having some conception of the common ground that we need uh, to recreate because the common ground already exists. The common ground, the, the, the way that we currently are as an organization is based on a set of, of reproducible ground, technologies, ideas, theories about the future and the past um, that we share. That's the way that the organization kind of sticks together and reproduces itself. So if we want to change our future, focusing on changing the common ground and our common understanding of the technologies and, um, and ideas and concepts that we have about who we are and what we're able to do, uh, as opposed to reducing autonomy of teams, uh, we can recognize their interdependence and recognize their their multiple concerns for what they want as not being the same um and still create common ground um and stay with the the trouble that we have with reproducing that common ground as a way of moving forward through transformation so i think that's me ranting for a while and and it was a beautiful rant um uh, and and I, I really love it. I, I, and I actually, if you go back to the the last slide, um, just for, yeah. for a second, because I think that um, that quote and I, and I and I really what I appreciated I think the most about this book is is as you teased out a little bit about staying in what is it means to be present and the entanglements we have and. Um, having just come out of our 2021 <clears throat> three day planning meetings and listening to people across the organization, having, you know, their past baggage and technical debt and trying to come up with a common ground for all of us to move forward with. It's, it's really, um, a, you know, a good way. It was an enlightening way for me to start thinking about our, um, how our, how to move our organizational forward and to find um, that common ground and where we are all entangled with. And um, for, for, um, for me, one of the things that really, and, and this is why I like this, this quote that you, you ended on, is one of the things she talks about is um, sort of the, the apocalyptical despair that many of us may feel at times about, you know, global climate change, or, you know, even though we're working towards something, we still, uh, you know, we may publicly present like, oh, this is, you know, we're going to make the world a better place, but we may um, succumb to the, you know, in our private talk, oh, it's never going to happen. Right. So she really um, creates a space, I think, for hope and um, and and moving forward, even in times where there are a lot of things on our plate to try and 
work out and unentangle or create new new conceptual ways of being in there and and I, I also what I one of the things that I, that I really appreciated about her was um, uh, she I think she puts it our comic faith and techno fix, fixes um, okay. at one point and um, and they could be secular or religious or, or something else and that somehow technology will come to our rescue and so that for me was really thing um, but she's not also saying go you know go away technology she's acknowledging that there are lots of uh, situated technology projects that are very important that are going to help us solve some of these issues and um, help and that, but it's also um, from for me the the important thing was um, the being with and the collaborations that we are, we have to make in all of our entanglements and in across our organizations, whether we're in you know a technology corporation like Red Hat or something, and we have multiple silos and lots of products and end users and partners, and trying to bring all of those folks together and recognize them them for the entanglements that they are. I just thought that was just a lovely way to. Um, Think about the work that we do on a daily basis, as well as um, some of the things um, that we need to do in the bigger world, and how even the technology tech that we are in is entangled with the rest of the greater world, and um, and our mission at Red Hat and other places, and how that is entangled with everything. It was, as as Joe was saying, completely mind blowing the book, um, and so I encourage everybody who, if you haven't read it. Um, it's a great read. So, um, if if anyone, if, any further commentary, I, I would happily um, on uh, Mark and, and other folks to un, unmute you and let you rant on. But that was for me. It it really resonated um, the collaborations and the being with and Oddkin. I mean, once you um, accept some of the new vocabulary and new rewording of things. Um, it really starts to make a lot of sense and, a, and is a nice framework for moving forward in you know this world that is 2021. Absolutely, I think like one of the terms that I've used a bunch of times uh, is being a grumpy optimist. So a grumpy optimist is someone who's not satisfied with the way things are, but part of the reason they're not satisfied is they know that they can get better. Um, and so you know it's it's not falling for either side of it. It's 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 the it's the junction of these two, like hopefulness and 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 and, and kind of dis, dissatisfaction, uh, that that actually makes progress happen. I think um, and allows you to kind of stay, stay with the problems that are kind of in front of you, in front of your organization, in front of the world. Um, yeah. So, yeah. An interesting example of it for me was yesterday, and I don't know, you know, I, I know you're on Twitter and everything, but some um, the the problem with because uh, I come from an open source community background, so I'm always watching for these these things that happen out there. And Elastic um, changed the licensing on their um, their projects, yep. Donner and Elastic. And yesterday, AWS announced that they were going to um, uh, make ter create a fork of it and create a truly open source project of it. And you know that it, that is a good thing, right? But because of all the baggage AWS comes with for around open source and contributing, there's a trust issue, right? And the wonderful thing I got to do on some Twitter stream was quote back something from Haraway, um, just about being in the, in the pre being a, being able to be in the present and think of this is a good thing they're doing, right? Yep. Yep. We need this, right? We need this open source project to live on in an open way. You know, yep. From my point of view, I'm not sure what the rest of everybody in the world thinks of, but that by being present and not thinking about, you know, not that we deny the any evil that someone has done in the past or may do in the future or what their reasonings are for it, but because of the entanglement of their products and their offerings and their end users, um, they didn't have to do this. That's right. right? Yep. But it was done and yep. it's a good thing. And yep. so being able to, let go of and I you know we do this all the time in in tech we get pissed off at our competitors or a foundation does something or you know accept something does it but being able to be really present with the people that we are in our um, entanglement with and to truly collaborate and see when we can work together it's just really 
And, you know, again, like not foreclosing a future possibility because yeah. of a past transgression, right? Yeah. Uh, and that that's the trick is to say like, listen, if you want to say that Amazon will not do this because they don't really know how to do it, and you refuse to let them do it, you for, if you foreclose that future, you assure yourself that it won't happen. Yep. <laughs> On the other hand, you know, if you open this possibility, if you open the space that they could become more like what you'd like them to be like, and mm -hmm. that this is maybe the first gesture towards making that future a possibility, then yep. you would want to encourage it, not discourage it. Yeah, so it, it, it's a, uh... So I, I thought it was um, it was a really good way um, to to be able to and, and I think that's I, people may question why we're talking about Haraway and why we're talking about these these um, more philosophical why we're, you're quoting quoting Greek folks and stuff like that on a technology podcast but I think it's these um, deeper ways of thinking about the problems that we're stuck in um, today um, when we just look at okay, I have to get this product release out the door um, and X, Y, and Z customers want this and X, Y, and Z <clears throat> customers want that and how do we reconcile that? But how do we bring a, bring a true collaboration with our end users, our partners, our uh, colleagues across silos and side of things? These ways of thinking about how we are related to each other really help, um, I think, help me a lot um, and, uh, in some ways, get your ego out of it too. I think that is another whole level of um, another conversation about that. Yep. But, um, it's definitely um, something that, that I, I look forward to more. And I think the Isabel Stanger books are, are next on my list, as well as still trying to get through the, the Senge books. And there's a whole slew of them. <laughs> so um, I'm not going to go back and read Greek um, philosophers this month, but maybe in the future, maybe that could be a retirement project. <laughs> But um, I was going to end with a quote that I really liked um, from her because uh, we're almost at the end of our hour or we are co quite close to it. But she says this wonderful thing that she says, um, nobody lives everywhere. Every, everybody lives somewhere. Nothing is connected to everything and everything is connected to something. Yep. And I think we, she talks about strings and connections and collaborations. And I just think that so um, is dead on. Um, yeah. with how we have to think about moving our our lives, our organizations, and our world views forward. Is that, um, I know Biden talked about unity and all of these things in the inauguration speech, but it really is. When we have such great divides and walls between us, um, I think realizing that we're, you know, it's not just six degrees of separation. We really are truly all connected and in interdependent. And it really was a, a great read and a great way to frame and kick off 2021. So I am, again, indebted with, with you. And now I'm going to have to go back and listen to this again and catch all of the, the book references um, and try and annotate this. But um, it, it's, it's a wonderful way. Next week, if you're around, um, Kevin Beer is going to do a talk, um, which he is tentatively entitling Rage Against the Silos and Other Windmills, cool. and on why many pop organizational truisms are not. Um, so that'll that'll be another fun conversation. So if you can join us, um, we. I've been hanging out with Kevin for eight years. I can't. He, it's always fun to listen to. Always good. Oh yeah, it, it's getting the word edgewise in with with Kevin is always the hard one when I'm doing this. So thank you again for coming cool. today, everyone who's listening. Um, I will post this up um, on our YouTube channel shortly, along with the slides and some semblance of annotation of all those amazing references that you made. I'm going to be hitting you up in chat later for a few of them. Um, but yeah, great talk again. Um, I just wonder what Haraway would think of it. Not me too. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll send her the link and ask. So, all right. Take care, Happy everybody. Be Thanks. safe and um, welcome to 2021. Happy New Year. Thank you.